welcome to Trash or Treasure, a season of podcasts finding out what happens to all the stuff we throw away. I'm Natalie Carney, and I'm taking you on a surprisingly fascinating journey around the rubbish heaps of Europe, looking at some of the innovations helping us to reduce our waste and even turn it into something useful. Today, we're taking a closer look at where our waste goes, and what better way to start than to familiarize myself with what I've been throwing away, and then trying to find out what happens to it all after it gets collected. Trash can have a very different life cycle depending on where you live in Europe. So I'm based in Germany, but I'm currently visiting family in Turkey. So I thought it would be quite interesting to see how waste management differs between the two countries, specifically between the two households. In Germany, we're very used to uh, separating everything within the household before we bring them to big giant bins and further separate them. That's not so much the case here. We've just finished dinner, so now I'm cleaning up and putting the leftover food in uh, to the exact same bag that everything else is in. Uh, what else is in here aside from the scraps from our dinner plate uh, include a plastic bag for what used to hold peanuts. There's the shells in here of those peanuts and also from pistachios. There's a fizzy soda bottle. There's also the end pieces uh, from melon a broken tea glass, <laughs> as well as a container that held milk. Now this should be squished down at least. I mean, to be honest, I'm not really sure where all this stuff goes. I'm very skeptical about it being separated at a larger plant. So no need to separate waste in Turkey. Nothing like what happens in Germany. I've been living in Munich since 2017, and I've had a very different experience of what I do with my waste here compared to back in Turkey. Most homes have several bins for different materials, which are unloaded into bigger bins on the street, which are emptied regularly. The Germans pride themselves on being the best recyclers in the world. Another country which usually scores rather well in the European waste management table is neighboring Austria. My colleague Johannes Fleschberger is based there and has also been giving me a sneaky view of what's in his trash can. Hello from the Austrian capital Vienna. I'm, I'm looking at what I've thrown away lately in my bin which is standing here on the kitchen floor. It's a medium sized bin of just 20 liters and next to it there's a cardboard bag which we use for paper waste. I just moved in here with my partner and we still have to adjust to each other's lifestyles, including waste recycling habits. Because actually I was used to separating glass and metal from the general waste and I will definitely try to introduce this habit also in the new home. So in Austrian cities like here in Vienna, each building complex has its own bins for paper, for general waste and often also for organic waste. Instead, recycling bins for glass, metal and plastic packaging can be found in certain corners on the streets. In Vienna, the residual household waste is being incinerated within the city limits, producing energy for district heating and district cooling, which is quite a cool thing. Let's take a closer look at this general waste bin here in my kitchen. So, uh, I can see leftover food, some plant trees, old toothbrush and actually yeah most of it it's plastic especially packaging material from online deliveries so what about this plastic waste according to EU statistics only one-third of plastic packaging waste is recycled in Austria which is a problem because Austria has one of the highest amounts of plastic waste per capita in the European Union and in fact, the recycling rate in Austria has even fallen slightly in the last 10 years. While the recycling rate in 2008 was still significantly above the EU average, Austria has been below the EU average since 2013. This is definitely not good news and makes me want to try harder to do my part. I will definitely try to introduce more plastic recycling into my new household. Thanks, Johannes. You sound like you really do think about where your waste goes and try and recycle it as much as possible. 
Indiana's often been seen as a bit of a poster child for innovative waste management. Since the 1990s, Austrians have dramatically cut down the amount of waste they send to landfills, even passing laws to restrict their use. Instead, they incinerate large quantities of household rubbish, which is turned into energy for heating and more recently, cooling. Trash to treasure, I wonder. Tell us more, Johannes. When people think of Austria, they're likely to visualize pristine snowy Alps and long winters. But summer temperatures in the capital, Vienna, are predicted to rise by more than 7 degrees over the next 30 years, and city authorities are taking note. They've been converting the city's waste into heating for 50 years, but now they're beginning to use rubbish to expand the district cooling network, making rubbish cool, so to speak. Waste is incinerated to produce a coolant, which is then pumped around buildings in order to lower room temperatures. Meet Georg Baresch from Wien Energie. We burn waste from about a third of the Viennese households, then we burn it in two boilers. And we can have a lot of energy out of the waste, because there is a lot of energy inside. I've been visiting the Spittelau waste incinerator in the north of the city. And we can produce district heating, hot water for about 60,000 flats and we can also produce electrical energy for about 50,000 flats. If we burn waste we have a lot of electrical energy and we have a lot of hot water. In winter we need this hot water for heating of the flats, but in summer we don't need it. And so we built here a very special plant, a district cooling plant, where we can bring the hot water inside and where we can produce cold water to cool buildings. For example, the General Hospital. This is the biggest hospital in Austria, and we heat this hospital many years ago, and since 2009, we also can cool the hospital with the cooling power from the plant. The waste plant was built in the 1960s, but got given a fantastic makeover in the 80s by Friedensreich Hundertwasser. He's the artist and architect who also designed the wonderfully imaginative Kunsthaus Wien. If you're not familiar with his work, think a sort of Gaudiesque, César Manrique style, avoiding straight lines, avant-garde flavor with a nod to Klimt and Schiele. This is not what you'd associate with a waste treatment plant. It's not hidden away like many industrial buildings outside the city limits, but a tourist attraction not far from the city center. Hundertwasser, who died in the year 2000, was a passionate environmentalist, so it's fitting that he was chosen to give this incinerator a new chimney and facade. Its magnificent golden dome can be seen for miles around. Berlin has its Fernsehturm, Shanghai its Oriental Pearl, Vienna chooses to celebrate its efficient waste incineration system with a tower and a multicolored, multi-shaped facade. There are black and white tiles interspersed with lovely irregular shapes and mosaics, tiled columns and crazy shapes. This is trash management as a contemporary art. But sorry, I'm getting slightly carried away with the trash as treasure theme, because this is an architectural gem. The Spittelau plant is one of three incinerators, which burn more than half a million tons of residual waste each year. They're incredible mechanical beasts, capable of converting waste into heating for 400,000 households, and now being used for cooling too. In summer, waste heat is used to power the cooling systems, which distribute the coolant directly to consumers. It's one of the largest systems in Europe, but the network is still relatively small. Vienna is now investing 80 million euros to build a cooling ring around the city center. This air conditioning system uses 70% less energy and produces 50% less CO2 than conventional devices. Of course, many environmentalists say incineration is not a sustainable solution for dealing with waste and will always opt for recycling or producing or using less in the first place. Johann Fellner, associate professor at the University of Technology in Vienna, says the Spittelau incinerator is one of the cleanest systems available, but not yet zero emission. 
Austria since 2004, it's forbidden to landfill waste which has an energy content which could be incinerated. So since this time period, uh, all the residual waste in Austria is, is incinerated. I would say that uh, Vienna's waste management system and waste incinerators are in a leading position all over the globe. We have emissions, there are definitely all the waste processes generate emissions, but emissions from waste incineration are very low. And if we compare it to traffic, that would imply that about uh, we travel about 100 kilometers by car if we compare emissions to waste incineration per person. The goal uh, would be to enhance the recycling rate, to have more materials recycled, in particular plastics. So until 2050, 50% of the plastics packaging waste needs to be uh, recycled. Today, at an Austrian level, we are about 30, 34%. So we need to increase. Uh, and this um, higher recycling target uh, demands to take out the plastics from the residual waste and recycle it. And there will be still uh, enough quantities that need finally to be incinerated. For waste, we don't have a better solution than incineration. It's estimated that incinerating the entire annual waste produced by one person produces the same carbon emissions as driving a car 100 kilometers. And many people prefer the idea of making treasure out of trash, in terms of rubbish being converted into heating or cooling energy, better than burying it in landfill, or worse, still, dumping it illegally. The Rautenweg is a landfill site on the city boundary. Here the slag and ashes from the incineration plant are rolled into the landscape. The waste is then covered with grass. Goats have been brought to life here. They not only eat the grass, they also entertain visitors who come to the site to learn about Vienna's extraordinary waste management system. Thanks again, Johannes. Not everyone agrees that incineration is the way to go. Just the thought of burning plastic fills me with anxiety, all those toxic fumes. Depending on how efficient the incinerator filters are at removing toxic material from emissions, some say it's an improvement on landfill and definitely illegal dumping. But it's not completely carbon neutral. Piotr Barczek is a senior policy officer for circular economy and waste policies at the European Environmental Bureau and a co-founder and advisor of the Polish Zero Waste Association. Its impacts are significant for many reasons. Environmental pollution, that's one. Pollution is also kind of emissions and uh, to the environment or to marine environment, to uh, rivers, then to sea. It has also significant problems when it comes to CO2 emissions because this fraction is typically the one that either has to be burned and burning plastics is, is much less efficient in a production of energy or burning of plastic generates much more CO2 than even equivalent of coal that is burned to produce the same amount of, of energy. So Piotr Barczek says burning plastic produces even more carbon dioxide than coal. Do you remember what the Viennese professor Johann Fellner told Johannes? Incineration may be a solution for now, but we could all do with producing less waste in the first place and increasing our recycling rates instead. We are in 21st century. The generation of energy comes from different sources such as renewable. The aim of circular economy in countries such as Austria should go much more in reduction of streams of waste that are not recyclable, first of all. And Vienna, for example, is collecting only only collecting the PET bottles. All the other plastic fractions, they don't collect as recyclable because it's not fitting into the system where such a huge incinerator has to be still operated for many years to come. So they need other plastic streams, like uh, wrappers, right, to fit this incinerator also with these uh, calorific streams. And you know, incinerator in Vienna is actually accepting also a lot of other waste from the region already because they don't have enough in Austria. I myself love a good deposit return scheme. In Germany, as in several other countries, when you return bottles for recycling, you get cash or vouchers back. It's a win-win. Most European countries have targets for improving the recycling rates. The EU intend to reuse or recycle 55% of all municipal waste by 2025, 60% by 2030, and 65% by 2035. But what's the plan in non-EU countries? Let's go to Serbia now, where my colleague Alyosha Malenkovic has recently received a brand new bin, which he's very excited about. 
Monday morning. Uh, it is the time for us to take out the garbage because the dump truck is coming through through this small suburb in Belgrade and picking up the trash. We have received two different containers for two different types of waste. One is communal waste and that one is being taken away every Monday and the second can, well, roughly twice a month. And this can is specially for recyclable waste. We received that as, as a part of a pilot project because recycling is in its infancy in Belgrade. Cans, transparent plastic bottles, cardboard, magazines, newspapers, and that's pretty much everything. But we realized that one trash can per two weeks is not enough because we produce much more recyclable waste than we thought we are and apparently uh, than the city authorities uh, thought they, uh, that we will produce. And we are very happy to be in position to recycle and to reduce the amount of communal waste we are actually throwing away and put much more into uh, that recyclable area. Uh, we are almost unique suburban part of a city which is being granted this as a pilot project. Uh, and it has to be done a lot more throughout Belgrade to raise the awareness for recycling and the need for recycling, that people need to do that. And uh, as I spoke with many of my friends here in Belgrade, many colleagues, everybody would be very happy uh, to participate in not just that pilot project, but they would like to recycle. They, they have that awareness. But... Why the town is not doing that? Why the town started? Uh, well, from upside down. The town first uh, has built or investing half, almost half a billion US dollars worth plant for incinerating waste and garbage, but they are not investing into recycling plants. Plants where uh, we'll recycle plastics, rubber, things which cannot be incinerated in the uh, incinerating facility. My family, we are happy that we have opportunity to recycle in Belgrade and we would like to see much more people doing the same. Thanks, Alyosha. Great that people are feeling so excited about recycling in Belgrade. At the moment, the Serbian capital's waste is sent to a giant landfill site at Vinchar outside the city. It's not a pretty sight or the most fragrant of landscapes. We sent Alyosha to hold his nose and go and take a look. I am right now at Vincha landfill. It is a huge waste dam, which is one of 10 worst eco-catastrophes, as was described by some in Europe. It is a huge landfill, which is the last destination for almost entire garbage pr production of uh, Serbian capital of Belgrade. It is 1.7 million people living in Serbian capital. And since Serbia and Belgrade itself don't have almost any either recycling culture or uh, recycling facilities for, for that waste, dozens and dozens or hundreds of uh, trucks, dump trucks are coming every day to this place and they are just unloading a lot of waste here. It's, it's really, really horrible huge huge dump and all the byproducts which are produced here because uh, so many things which are thrown here are uh, in the process of decaying are just releasing a lot of toxic material into water into air i'm seeing also some small fires which are apparently constantly burning. I was told that uh, fires here cannot be extinguished because a lot of material which can be incinerated is actually burning uh, constantly way under the ground. And that's something that cannot be rectified anytime soon. They will try to do something. They will try to put some kind of uh, special uh, material on top of uh, entire hill and they will try to uh, reclaim this piece of land for eco purposes but they will dr drill a lot of holes when you see all this waste which is burning 
thousands and thousands of tons of waste and a couple of small streams are actually flowing right through that wasteland and they become so polluted it is almost impossible to to see the water because uh, they became stream of toxic foam and all that water actually ended up in nearby Danube Danube River and polluting on the way to entire ecosystem from this place to to the Danube River smell is something that you cannot describe you cannot compare it to anything uh, it is smell which can be associated only with the places like this and the smell isn't the only problem. As Alyosha says, the landfill sites are leaking into rivers and along with illegal dumping, affecting some of the most beautiful places in the region. One of the countries I'm very frequently covering is Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I'm currently in the small town of Visegrad. Visegrad is famous for two things. One is 16th century bridge. That iconic bridge was built by the Ottoman Empire back in 16th century and that bridge is built over Drina River. One if not the most pristine waters of the entire Balkans. For the last couple of decades, even more maybe, Drina River is in danger from enormous amounts of garbage, waste, which is coming from neighboring Montenegro and Serbia. After the civil war, which happened here back in the 1990s, and after peace arrived, people's standard started rising, and people started buying much more goods than they had money to buy before. And Drina River was hit hardest by that surge of mostly plastics and any other wrappings or, or packaging Many settlements which are along this river have their waste dumps, mostly legal waste dumps, located at the banks of the Drina River. So when snow starts melting, waters are taking all of that garbage directly into the Drina River. Maybe some five kilometers upstream from the town of Visegrad is a dam, which is built there back in 1960s, 1970s. That dam, luckily for the rest of Drina River, is holding up all that waste which is coming uh, from Montenegro and from Serbia. I feel that no words can describe this man-made horror. Just the sight of it tells way much more than any reporter can do. And as I was told, this is nothing compared to what it was here back in January. I've just witnessed several workers fighting an well, unwinnable battle, apparently trying to remove as much as possible this garbage from, from the lake using a small crane and the truck. On a daily basis, they are delivering, well, they are actually picking up between 10 and 20 of those trucks of garbage every day, of mostly plastic waste from this dam, from this lake. Just in the last three months, they took 5,300 cubic meters of the waste from this lake. They tried to stop the flow of that garbage towards the dam with something they call a chain, although it doesn't look like a chain. It's just a string of oil barrels which are attached together across the lake and they are trying to prevent, try to stop the inflow of this garbage towards the dam. But it is only partial success because as I was told on January 2nd this year, the inflow of the garbage was so huge that the chain snapped and all that garbage went towards the dam. This is ab absolute horror. Illegal dumping happens all over Europe with some really terrible results for wildlife and the environment, as Alyosha saw at the dam in Bosnia. Back in neighboring Serbia, authorities are redeveloping the land site at Vinchar outside Belgrade to increase capacity, as well as building a giant new incinerator like the ones in Austria. Initially, the project had some funding from the EU, but the union has now stopped investing in incineration and is focusing on prevention, reuse and recycling.
they decided to build a new uh, landfill with capacity of 170,000 tons annually. They said that uh, according to the plans, uh, two-thirds of entire uh, waste production in Belgrade will be incinerated in this new facility which is under construction which should become fully operational by year 2023. And that, uh, that facility should produce electricity and should produce uh, heat for some parts of Belgrade. But remaining 170,000 tons annually will be, well, just put in that new landfill and then uh, all the water which goes and flows through that new landfill will be treated in the new, new plant and it will be released as clean water into Danube River. They don't have any recycling facility here. They're investing over half a billion US dollars into this facility and yet the only thing they are going to recycle here will be construction uh, waste, uh, which will be recycled and reused as a gravel uh, for uh, new constructions. And, and we haven't heard about uh, the plans for building plastic recycling facility, rubber recycling facility. Tires are a huge uh, eco problem here in this region. And we haven't seen any of the, uh, of the recycling facilities for it. Thanks, Alyosha. Next time, we're going to be taking a closer look at how Europe is doing on the recycling front. I'll be visiting a plastic recycling plant here in Munich, where I'll be finding out what happens to the mountains of plastic we throw away every year and how much of it can really be recycled. Don't forget to take a look at the trash map of Europe to find out what happens to your waste. We want to know what goes in your bin and where you think the stuff you put in it goes. No, honestly. You can also find out more about exporting waste in the Answers Project podcast on the CGTN Europe website. Join me next time for more Trash or Treasure.